Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. One of my sweet mates in Wolford Hall likes to put up posters and printouts with slogans and images and personal manifestos. One of them, put innocuously on the bathroom door, is actually a radical, subversive, nationalist symbol of political dissent. <laughs> and in case you can't read it, it says, be stoked. What we see is the comforting smile of an old, older Tibetan man with a simple, perhaps reductionist, life lesson the Chinese government sees as a threat to state sovereignty. Since the Dalai Lama was forced into exile in 1959, any images of him have been banned in China. This is just one small piece of the Tibetan conflict, but it symbolizes the depth of the divide on many, many issues. There is probably no more important American scholar on these issues than Melvin Goldstein. He's the John Reynolds Harkness Professor of Anthropology and co-director of the Center for Research on Tibet at Case Western Reserve University. And he specializes there in Tibetan society and history. Professor Goldstein has conducted extensive field work in Tibet on a range of topics, including nomadic pastoralism, oral history, monasticism, and, as he'll be talking about mostly tonight, socioeconomic change in rural areas. He's authored 12 books and over 100 articles in his field, and his current projects include a large Tibetan oral history web archive, which will be permanently housed at the Library of Congress, the third volume of his series on modern Tibetan history, and a longitudinal study of modernization and change in rural Tibet, funded by the National Science Foundation. Professor Goldstein's talk tonight is sponsored by the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies here at Claremont McKenna College. I must remind you that photography and recording of any kind are both prohibited during the talk. Please join me in welcoming Professor Goldstein to the Athenaeum. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've heard so much about this university and its campus, and I had a nice walk around today, and I was really impressed. Perhaps blown away would be more uh, of the of uh, my impression. Let me start, I have a lot of things to say and uh, I don't want to go over too much. Uh, most of what we hear about Tibet are abuses of human rights by the Chinese government and incidents of protest by Tibetans who are almost always portrayed as marginalized, impoverished, angry, and undergoing assimilation and cultural genocide. Much of this is true to be sure, but the situation there is more complicated and there is another side to life in Tibet, particularly life in rural Tibet, where 82% of the population lives. Uh, so let's first start with where, where do the, uh, t the Tibetans in China live? There are six million of them. And uh, as you can see here, uh, half of them, three million, live in what's called the Tibet Autonomous Region. The Tibet Autonomous Region was political Tibet, the Tibet that the Dalai Lama ruled uh, since 1642. Uh, either autonomously or independently. The other half of three million live uh, in the surrounding provinces, Shanghai, Gansu, Sichuan, and Yunnan. Uh, now these people are culturally different. Uh, they've lived a different history under different governments, uh, and so they're quite different. Uh, the problems there are different than in Tibet. So number one, you have to have a more nuanced view that Tibetans aren't Tibetans any more than people living here are the same as people living in the mountains of West Virginia. There are substantial differences that before you generalize, you'd have to take into account who you're talking about. I'm talking about people in the Tibet Autonomous Region, so let's narrow it. And even more so, I'm talking about two groups of people that I've been studying for many years. The group I'm talking most about tonight are three farming villages near Shigate, the second biggest city in, in Tibet. This uh, had a research design of taking three villages at different stages of modernization in Tibet under the idea, again, that you can't just say that village Tibet is village Tibet. Some are much more modern and developed, some are not. One of these, the more developed, we'll call, and the richer one, is just outside of Shigase, the city. The second one is just outside of Penam, which is a county, a county town, so it's also near uh, a more urban site. The third one lives up in the mountains behind this uh, Penam county, and it's the poorest, and it's in a mountain area. So the second uh, group that I've studied, and I've been studying them since 1997, going back many, many times. Recently, I've been to these villages in 2006, 7, 9, and 11. Uh, 
And uh, the second one are nomads in Pala. That's about 300 miles west of Lhasa in a really remote part of Tibet. Uh, these people live at altitudes of 15,200 feet to 17,600 feet. Uh, they're far from any major roads, uh, and I've been studying them since 1986, going back many, many times. In that group, more recently, I've been back in 2000, 2005, 2009, and 2011. So I'm talking about my experiences here mostly uh, based on my own field work over time, seeing how these societies have changed. So I want to tell you then is how is life lived for most of these people in Tibet, the 82%. Uh, this is a picture of the mountain village, the poorer one. Uh, they're quite pretty and nice. Uh, it's scenic, and uh, the houses are sometimes together in clusters, sometimes scattered in their fields. Uh, if you get up close, this is what one of the older houses looks like. Uh, and the thing we have to understand when we talk about rural Tibet is that rural Tibet is a Tibetan world. There are no Han Chinese living in rural Tibet. There are no Han Chinese in these villages. There are no Han Chinese in the nomad camps. The local officials are Tibetan. The mode of, uh, of language is Tibetan. They eat Tibetan food. The women certainly wear Tibetan clothes, and as you can see here, uh, some of the men also uh, still wear Tibetan clothes, but most of them wearing now uh, a more Western type or uh, Eastern Chinese type. So uh, it's a very different world, and it's one that sometimes if you close your eyes and you're walking by and you see a picture of someone like him or two or three like him plowing their fields, it reminds me of pictures of National Geographic in 1940. Uh, but that's not the case. It's not 1940. Things have changed a great deal. Let me give you just another picture of just some people living in the villages. And that's what they look like. It's rather traditional in many of their customs and in uh, some of their techniques of how they farm. But they ran into a problem. Starting in 1979, uh, China's second revolution started. And that's when Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, came to power and they ended the commune system and started to uh, have this socialist market s system. All over China, communes ended, and for farmers, they divided the land between the members of the commune, so it came back to be a household in Tibet also. Households then again became units of production and consumption. Production in the sense that they had land, they didn't own the land, the state owned it, but they had long-term leases. So the families again could plan, plant what they want, basically sell it when they want and try to improve their quality of life. Everybody in Tibet came out very, very poor at the end of the Cultural Revolution. In Tibet, the communes were broken up about 1980. Uh, the nomads, they divided the animals among each household. What happened in the farming area, which is what I'm going to talk about first, is what I call the farming dilemma. Everybody at decollectivization, when the commune ended, got a share of the land. So if myself and my wife got five acres each, we too had 10 acres, uh, uh, five acres per person. By the end of the 1980s, we had three kids. Now we have five people in our household. But because we don't own the land, we can't buy and sell it. So now we have five people with 10 acres. So the per capita amount of land has gone down. On top of that, there's been some land loss. If people build a new house, where are they going to build it? They can only build it on their own farmland. So more land was lost. Some land was lost by eminent domain. It's not only an American thing. It's common in China when the government wants to build a road or something. So the per capita amount of land has decreased in China uh, because of population growth mainly, but also because of some of these secondary things. So as they went on then from starting with units of production on a family basis, then they found that it became harder because of inflation. There was inflation in part because the government stopped subsidizing things like fertilizer, which went up in price because it's gasoline-based uh, and uh, petroleum-based and uh, other kinds of just manufacturing inflation. So the prices of what they had to pay for things increased while the land per capita was decreasing. Uh, however, the value of their own crops didn't increase and still hasn't because Tibetans plant barley and a kind of coarse wheat. The barley nobody else in China really eats. Chinese don't eat the barley. So it's only so it could be sold in Tibet. Uh, the wheat is coarse, and to make nice flour, uh, they prefer either Nepalese or Chinese flour. Even the villagers buy that. So they have a limited use, and the price hasn't gone up. The third thing is that all of the new manufactured goods that you'll see that they have, 
uh, these people want it just as we want to consume here. There's a tremendous urge to improve the quality of your life, and that means buying stuff, manufactured clothes, uh, blenders, all kinds of stuff. People buy refrigerators in villages still. So there was a, then a crunch that they had because their crops weren't worth any more money. They weren't going up, and they couldn't increase it. They already have pretty sophisticated agriculture with uh, 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 improved seeds, heavy fertilization, insecticide use. So there was no way they're going to, say, double and quadruple the output to make up for this difference. So they had to do something. To, they had to pay for that fertilizer every year. And when I first went, people were nervous. How are they going to pay for the fertilizer? Uh, and so what they started to do is what they call going for income. That means migrant labor. But I think it's useful to see how they conceptualize it, going for income. Uh, <clears throat> which is exactly what it was. They started going outside the village to work as wages, uh, f for wages, for cash, on a, as migrant laborers. Uh, initially, they mostly worked in manual labor in construction uh, projects, working for a few months. Often they would go after the fields are planted. Planting is a men's job, plowing is a men's job, and then they come back at the time of harvest to help the family bring in the harvest. Uh, this is a picture of some of them in 2009. Some were still working in migrant labor, uh, in manual labor. Uh, this quickly, this going for income, became astonishingly quickly the dominant rural economic strategy. When we started this, when I started, uh, when they started this, this was subsistence farming basically. Uh, it changed very quickly then to uh, a uh, uh, cash income kind of village uh, economy. So. If they're going out and working and getting jobs, where are the jobs coming from? It wasn't that the government said, you're uh, Tibetans in Tibet Autonomous Region, we're going to give you preference uh, for jobs. It was nothing like that. They went out and found jobs themselves because the Chinese government has been funding development projects in the Tibet Autonomous Region for a number of reasons, particularly since the middle 1990s. One was to develop infrastructure. A lot of money, enormous amounts of money were put in for roads, airports, communication systems, bridges. Uh, partly as an end in itself, to have a more developed Tibet, but also to link Tibet more closely with the rest of China uh, by having um, enterprises and businesses from China coming into Tibet and working, many of them then staying. And the third thing that uh, underlying this strategy was to improve the standard of living for Tibetans in order to induce more loyalty for Beijing vis-a-vis -vis the Dalai Lama. Now, I'm, I'm concentrating this, there's really several steps, but for the purpose here we can say that this amounts to China's internal strategy. They don't call it this. Their internal strategy is that uh, try to win the loyalty of Tibetans by making their life better. The external strategy was to negotiate with the Dalai Lama to see if he would agree to what the terms that they would give. Now he couldn't, so gradually there's been more and more stress on this internal strategy as I'll show you. So the government put in increasingly more money. After 2000, there's a developed the West campaign, large amounts of money increased. In 2006, the 11th five-year plan put even more money in. So there's been a lot of government coming in. Most of this has been criticized in the West and by the Tibetan exiles as going to Han Chinese enterprises, which meant that billions went in and billions went out back to the Han areas. And that's absolutely true. But what nobody understood, because nobody is really looking in the villages, is that uh, there was also enough trickling down, the famous trickle-down theory, uh, that there was jobs for these people. And so it's this trickle-down from the development that's transformed rural Tibet. Uh, so let's look a little bit further. Going for income was so lucrative for village households that it has increased exponentially. Uh, if we take then from the villages I studied and look at the increase in the percent of households that sent at least one person to earn non-farm income uh, out of the village is pretty impressive. If we take these three villages that I talked about, one less developed and poorer, one near a county seat and one near the city, in 1997, based on our household surveys, 58% uh, had sent one person and the other village 43%. The rich village we only started studying in 2006. Uh, we say 2005 because we got data from the previous year. Then if you look at 2005, just eight years later, eight years later, 92% in all of these are sending one person out of the household. 92% means everybody. The only people who aren't are old couples who are too old to work or an individual old person or somebody who is crippled or a, a new family who has uh, two small kids and just can't do it. So virtually everybody was sending one. 
40%, more than 40% were sending two people out to earn income. Uh, the proportion of males going out, if you look at this, it's just astonishing. Uh, in the poor village, uh, to save time, I won't do all of them, but of all the males aged 20 to 29, in 1997, 18% had gone out in that year. In 2005, it was 69%. In the 30 to 39, it goes from 25 to 72%. That means that uh, roughly 70% of every single male in that village, uh, uh, counting the old people in that, uh, were going out for income. So the, do the dominant rural economic strategy has been sending as many members as possible for migrant labor. Obviously, if you send two people, you can earn twice as much as one person if they both do the same job. However, the problem is that they're not giving up farming. These are not people who are moving to urban areas and don't care about farming. They need the farmland and they farm to get their basic food uh, so they don't have to buy it. So it has to be balanced by who does the work. So one of the impacts of this on family life and village life is that, number one, the young people who are going out and earning money have a much greater say in what happens. They're bringing in the cash. Even though they turn it over to the household head, they have a lot more influence in the decisions in the household, even though they're very young. And the second is that older people have to do more work. There are people 70 years old who are taking animals up into the mountains. And the farmers live at 13,500 feet, which is not high compared to the nomads. But 13,500 feet uh, walking up and down the hills is not easy. It's, 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 it's hard. So there's a lot of problem then with uh, not enough labor left in the villages. So, how did they maximize uh, the ability to earn income? One was that there's been a revitalization of fraternal polyandry. Does everybody know what that is? No, okay. Tibetans common kind of marriage of fraternal polyandry is two, three, or four brothers take one wife. The, the brothers are in the household, so your father has three or four sons, they take one bride in for all of them. That has a wonderful effect. Number one, it keeps the land intact. They already have a decrease in land per capita. So now instead of each of the four brothers getting a quarter of the land, the next generation, the four have one set of kids and the land isn't divided. The second thing is they have more people to work. So if you have four people and you have two fathers, uh, then you have six males who can do things. So fraternal polyandry is uh, widespread in this area. Uh, the second thing is that they started sending more young unmarried women uh, for migrant labor. If you see here in the poor village in 1997, almost no young women went, unmarried women. Why? Because if a young unmarried woman becomes pregnant, she basically loses her chance at getting married. So parents didn't want to send their daughters. But then you look at 2005, it's increased astonishingly, up to 32% and 17%. And you can guess what the reason is. There's been a widespread, wide-scale acceptance of contraception. So people are all using contraception, and uh, the young women can go out by themselves for months on end uh, in these labor camps and labor construction sites. And uh, whatever they do, we won't say that here, but whatever they do, if they're taking contraception, they're not going to get pregnant. So families are getting more comfortable with letting their, their daughters. But this is all a kind of a tremendous stress. And why are they doing this? At first, it was to pay for fertilizer. Now they're doing it to improve the quality of their life and compete in the uh, market economy, and I'll show you how now. So there's, first, let me go to this. There's been a total transformation of the rural economy. In 1997, 76% of the income came from the farm products that they grow, and only 24% from cash income. Eight years later, the roles are reversed. 79% came from non-farm income from migrant labor, and 21% came from farm products. And I'm sure that's increased in 1911, uh, uh, and, and will continue. So it, the whole rural economy has, ha, has changed, and that's changing how Tibetans operate and their family, their attitudes, and their values. I can't get into too much of that here. but So let's see how this played out. As Tibetans got more richer, they had more money, excess money from working and getting two salaries coming in in a year. They started to spend more on the same things we do, fixing their house, buying nicer furniture uh, with nice painted furniture, buying nice rugs, exactly the same kind of consumer culture materialism that we have here. They're very much into that in rural Tibet. So here you see some of the early uh, guys who start to get hired drawing uh, paintings. This guy's actually a monk who's making side money. Uh, during the paintings on cabinets. In the other one, these uh, two young guys are, are weaving rugs. So first, the traditional craft things started to come back because people were trying to fill their house with traditional things. Uh, and in order to get this, more families then said, gee, we can make more money 
if we train our kids not to just take a shovel and dig, but if we train them to be craftsmen, to learn how to weave, to learn how to paint, to be carpenters. So there was a whole movement has started where parents would take one son in a polyandrous family, even two sometimes, and apprentice them to carpenters and to stonemasons because they can get more salary. So uh, that's an attempt then, what is that? That's an attempt of rural Tibetans not sitting passive in the village, thinking about the opportunities that the new society and economy offers them and making choices to try to benefit from it and be su successful. Uh, they also learn, in particular, not just traditional skills like stone masonry and carpentry, but driving. Driving is the highest wage of these uh, migrant labor activities. Many of them would then become apprentices to somebody who knew how to drive uh, so that they could become a driver and work for somebody else driving. The salaries may be three times as much. Uh, for that, and they can work for a much longer during the year. That led to people then saying, now I can drive, and I'm earning quite a bit of excess money uh, that I have. They began buying tractors and trucks and buses and starting small businesses. Here you see a, uh, a, a family in the rich village who had a business of making mud bricks from the soil in the village, and they take it on their tractor into Shigase, the city, where there's a lot of construction going on, and they sell it. That was one of the smaller kind of industries. Uh, people would then buy trucks like this, these old trucks, and start to get involved in carrying stuff to construction sites. And eventually, you got uh, people starting larger enterprises with big trucking firms. Trucking firms meaning one or two trucks uh, with very expensive trucks, like this. This is a villager, a real villager, uh, in the rich village in front of his new house uh, with a truck that may have cost 250,000 renminbi. These are very expensive. Well, how's, I mean, how does he get that? He takes a loan from the bank. All these People now are involved with banks. The ABC Bank, the Agricultural Bank of China, is giving a lot of loans to rural Tibetans. Many of them have lines of credit where they just go in and they can get up to 50,000 renminbi the next day by signing their name. And for those who are going out and earning money, they think it's fine because they're going to earn money next year and next year and next year. And so they can pay it off over five years. They're taking risks going into business. They're learning more Chinese because of this, and they're dealing with big companies. So this guy, in fact, was contracted to uh, work on a site in the far west of Tibet where they were building a highway and an airport. Uh, and that's maybe three or four days drive there. Uh, they also started construction companies. They, the carpenters were working for somebody else and the stonemasons, so some carpenters said, gee, we can do this. They'll get 10 or 20 guys doing manual labor, a couple of stonemason friends, one or two uh, junior carpenters, and they go to the government and say, can we get a contract to build a house? What they're building here is in the nomad area I work. In, in 2009, the government gave every township, nine or 10 villages have an administrative unit, unit it's called a shang, it's a rural township. Uh, and so each rural township all over the Tibet Autonomous Region got one of these community buildings for about 75,000 women be. And this contractor are villagers from near the area I am. But you can see these are not guys with a shovel. They have a, a gasoline generator, which is hooked up to, to run a table saw. And they're having big windows. They can make concrete floors, concrete steps. So there's a development there on this level also from starting out just going out to pay for their fertilizer bills. So what you begin to see is what I think of as, as an entrepreneurial transition in rural Tibet. Uh, and again, it shows that all rural Tibet is, is not the same. If, if we look at this, the poor village, 66% in 2005, was still doing manual labor. But you can see the middle village is less, 41%. The rich village, 27%. Uh, presumably, at one time, everybody in the rich village was doing 66%. But it's gone down to 27% because they're doing this. They've developed skilled labor, vehicle drivers, owners, businessmen. So in that area, only 23 are doing manual labor, and 62 are doing higher scale work. They're competing, they're doing better, they're earning more money, uh, and they're thinking even bigger and bigger, buying another truck, stopping, uh, opening a business, opening up a store, and so on. So that this is a major change in thinking, in attitudes. It's led to much greater increase in value of, of, of education. Uh, then. In 2006 to 2010, that's the, five, that's the 11th, fifth year plan, the government had been putting in a tremendous amount of money into infrastructure. And they were criticized that it's not helping the local Tibetans. Nobody realized the trickle-down effect. 
So it didn't look like it was helping because all they were building were bridges and airports and trains and stuff like that that didn't affect the villages. And many villages had no electricity, no running water. Uh, so in that sense, the uh, basic conditions were very, very poor. So the government then stepped in. You have to realize that what's, what does the government care about these three million to, uh, Tibetans there? They're trying to win them over. They're trying to win them over without making a deal with the Dalai Lama. So they felt that what they need to do now is to get development at the rural level into the villages, not into the larger things. And to do that, they started with a bunch of programs to improve social services and to improve things like houses. They came up with the ingenious plan, if not bizarre plan, to say that you can't have a good life in modern China without a comfortable house. Uh, somebody in Beijing thought that up. And so then they said, money is of no consequence. I mean, this is, this is their national interest. They're not going to give up Tibet, and they're not ready to just send five million Chinese there uh, into the villages. They're not letting that happen. So they said, we're going to give everybody, 80% of the rural population, new houses or renovated houses at a phenomenal amount of money to do 80%. And uh, they did that. That created a housing boom. Uh, here you see a, a, a new house uh, a, a big house in one of the villages. These are very expensive uh, to build these. Uh, and this is what the house looks like, a house, not this house, another house from the inside. Tibetan houses usually have very narrow windows. They're very dark. Now they're building these kind of bay window types of things with glass all around facing south. Why? Because it's freezing in, in, in Tibet and you get the southern sun uh, coming in. So this is what the house looks like before it's finished. Here it's not finished either. Uh, this is the way they carve it. This is traditional Tibetan carving. The next thing is what somebody's house looks like after it's finished. Now they have so much extra money, rich people and middle income people, that they paint all of these beams and pillars uh, in these kind of traditional monastery-like designs. Uh, he has beautiful cabinets, tables. He's got his built-in TV. He's got uh, boom boxes. Uh, this is just one of the rooms in his, in his house. This is his entertainment room. So uh, they're spending a lot of money, but they're doing things in traditional Tibetan ways. And they want to do it that way because they have great pride in their culture. Uh, but they also don't think that doing nothing and living like they did in 1980 is a good thing. They want to be modern and have better things, and they're trying hard to get them. Uh, other things that this new program since, 19, uh, since 2006 has been in terms of social services, they have pretty good health insurance in rural Tibet now. Uh, it was bad when I first came, and it's improved and improved. Now virtually everybody takes it. It's voluntary, <coughs> but uh, unlike the United States. But it's voluntary. Uh, but people only have to pay per person 10 renminbi. That's like a dollar and, and a half a year. So uh, that gives them a booklet with to be able to go for primary medicine care, uh, the, the county, the government, and the national government put in money on top of that. And it means now for them to go to a hospital in a city, they may have to, the government pays 80%. In some cases, they pay 90%. So that's pretty good health care. And people, most of them are doing it, I think almost everybody in these villages and the nomad area do it. And it's uh, pretty good. They allow them to go to Tibetan doctors as well, not just uh, allopathic doctors, but uh, so it's improved a lot. Education has improved. When I first went, none of the farmers thought it was useful to have their kids educated. And it probably wasn't, because what are they going to do? Uh, well, since then, there's been a lot that they can do, and people have realized that having one son getting a government job can be a tremendous benefit to the family over time. So there's much greater interest in it, and that's coincided with the Chinese government starting compulsory education up to the ninth grade. What they've done is they've eliminated all the village schools, which were really poor quality, and they created for one of these townships a big school, and this is the township school in the mountain area. This is that poorest village up there. It's a big school, and for these eight or nine villages, the ones that are too far to come on a day basis, they, uh, it's a boarding school where they get free food, uh, uh, room and board, clothing, books, uh, and they really give these. Uh, education is free through junior high school. I think even high school, there's hardly any kind of a cost. The teachers in this school are all Tibetans. Uh, uh, one of them even speaks English. Not much, but enough English. I could have a conversation with him. Uh, they teach Tibetan language is used for the teaching in the class, and the textbooks are in Tibetan. 
Now, it doesn't mean that the textbooks are what we would think would be good. They're usually translation of Chinese textbooks, and they have no relevance to the village. It's not a perfect system. Tibet's not perfect. There's a lot of problems everywhere. But there's a lot of good things, so I'm kind of talking about the things that have been positive and, and useful. So uh, this is going on, and now everybody goes. Virtually everybody goes now until the, until the ninth grade. So Children's Day is a big day in Tibet, as in China, it's June 1st, and the kids put on skits just like here, and the parents go and see their kids singing and dancing and doing things, and they really love it. The parents are all, are, are all in the background there. It was a big area in front of the, uh, the school. These guys who go for migrant laborers, often they'll come back and see their kids perform on this day. So some of the performances are done wearing the school uniform, like this, but not all of them. They were doing the school uniform uh, in, in kind of a modern dance. In this group, you had some young girls in another class. Each class had its own little skit, and they were dancing in the traditional Tibetan clothes, a Tibetan type of dance. And the thing that struck me about this and what's going on in Tibet is this picture. This is the teachers. The teachers put on a skit, but what did they do? They're wearing traditional Tibetan blouses uh, and dancing a traditional Tibetan circle dance but they're wearing tight pants and boots. Now, normally, they should be wearing this kind of a outfit. But they are doing something that shows Tibetan culture is valued, and we're not uh, ignoring it and saying we shouldn't do it and just dressing modern and dancing. They're showing the students that, as the agents of change, our culture is good, but we also should be modern. And some of the skits were skits where one kid would play the father and another kid would say, you should let your kids go to school. It's important in the modern age. So th there's this thing of modernization in there. But it's also, it's not a rejection of their traditions. This is very important because we often think that everything's lost. And these are all Tibetans. I actually went to the teacher after this and said, would you show me the script that these kids had memorized? And he showed me it was all in Tibetan. Uh, it was not that they told the kids what to say, but they were using Chinese. So there's a lot good going on, and this is not a sophisticated area. Uh, now, so that's what's going on in the village. Tremendous change, tremendous ramifications for family, for interpersonal uh, relations, and we don't know where it's going to end. Uh, the nomads are a different adaptation, and I'll do that quickly, not much time. This is what nomad country where I work looks like. It's fantastically beautiful, open. It's uh, uh, that's a group of nomads moving somewhere. It's uh, very few people in endless mountains and valleys going for hundreds of miles east and west. Uh, that's a, a traditional nomad tent. Nomads mean that they raise animals entirely. They don't grow crops. They move the animals at different times of the year. They harvest a lot of products from the animal, and they eat some themselves, use some them, themselves for food and clothing, and they sell the rest for things like barley and pots that they don't make. That's their traditional adaptation. And that is still basically going on. The production system of the nomads, like much of the farming area, some of these farming areas have tractors if they're large flat areas, but many in the mountain areas are too small for tractors, so they're still plowing with, uh, uh, with, uh, with animals. Here you see one of the things that goes on, dairy production. I can't talk about the whole system, but just let me outline this quickly. This is a clever system. This is a traditional culture over centuries has developed that really makes uh, uh, the possible for people to live in this extremely harsh environment. Uh, winters in this area are 30, 40 below zero. Uh, it's extremely windy. Uh, it's phenomenally cold. It is so cold that uh, my colleague and I stopped drinking at 4 o'clock in the afternoon so we wouldn't have to go to the bathroom during the night in winter. It's really cold. Uh, in June, the midnight, the evening temperatures are below zero. This is a tough place. Uh, so they get a lot of dairy products in summer when the grass is new. For eight months, there's no new grass. They don't feed them grains. They eat the leftover grass. It's like eating your yard. Uh, there are lawns out here. It's like what's left over in September is what they eat for the next four months, eight months. Uh, so uh, it's a tough place, but they have an adaptation that works really well. One of the things they do is take the plentiful amount of dairy products in summer, which they can't keep. Dairy milk won't keep, it'll spoil. And so they convert it into calories that they can use throughout the whole year. And how do they do that? Well, they first uh, make yogurt. They take the milk and they put a starter in, leave it overnight covered just as we would do. They take the yogurt and then they, they, they put it in a churn like this. And there's a paddle at the bottom of the churn here uh, of the uh, stick. And if you churn that for about 30 minutes, you get butter. 
out of it. They take the butter and they sew that in the intestine of a sheep really tight. They squeeze out the water. It can last a year uh, like that. The calories are trained. Then they take the buttermilk. After the butter is taken out, there's a, there's a fluid left. They boil that. They get cheese. I'll show you a picture later. That cheese lasts forever. I still serve my students in my class cheese from my eight years ago. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's like a rock. So they, they have two products then to move the calories throughout the year. It's a, it's a, this, everything is, is, is like that in their traditional uh, uh, culture. They have meat, of course, for the animals and skins. Uh, and they, uh, they tan the skins. But this is a villager. These villagers come up from migrant labor traditionally up to nomad areas and uh, tan their skins. Why do they tan their skins? Because the nomads don't like to tan skins. It's not their culture. They don't do that kind of work. This is a traditional cultural value still keeping on to this day because it's not part of what they think they should do. And the, the farmers are just like the ones I study, except instead of going on construction projects, they come up here and build houses for nomads and tan their, their, their skins. And these skins then are really valuable because in winter, whatever they wear in summer, uh, if they're wearing shirts or, well, these people are still using chubas, but in the winter, you have to wear a robe like this with the fleece on the inside. So they usually kill the meat only in late November. They kill it in late November because after eight months of eating senescent grass, the grass that's left after the growing season, the animals lose a lot of weight. They're very thin. And if you kill an animal in June, you're getting less calories per animal than you do when they've eaten all summer and they're fat. You get a skin that's useless because it's uh, thin. So if they kill them all in November, they get the best skins for their cloaks or for sale. They get more meat per animal and they don't have to worry about storing it because it's so cold by the end of November that they just take a leg of lamb and throw it in their tent and it freezes overnight. Uh, in the tents in winter, everything froze overnight. The water, the meat, my toothpaste, everything froze overnight. Uh, <laughs> these are tough people. Uh, but there's also been a lot of changes, so I don't want to talk more about the traditional period. Uh, that's another lecture. But one of the things that changed early on was from tents to houses. Now, a lot of people read it in the papers, including the Chinese papers, that the government is sedentarizing the nomads, making them live in houses and give up being nomads. That's really mistranslation. It's not a mistranslation. The government officials write these articles are lying because they think the government wants to hear that, by and large. And so uh, what they're really doing is giving them houses. So people in the area I'm in started building houses on their own. There was one house left after the commune uh, ended, the commune house that they use for the administration. One nomad bought it. And you know, tents are nice when you see them in pictures, when you're living in them. They're phenomenally noisy in winter. The tents flap, the wind is terrible, it's so noisy. And uh, it's cold. The tents are great when they're new, but all the tents aren't new. Uh, as you see here, it's patched here and it's patched there and it leaks and it's open in the middle. So they're also colder at night. The temperature when the fire is going was okay when you're sitting there, as soon as the fire goes out, it, it becomes the ambient temperature outside in like 10 minutes. Uh, so they're cold. Houses don't have that. Houses are, uh, are also windproof, uh, but they're uh, warmer and they're not noisy. So people started building tiny houses like this uh, and more and more built them. And they build them at their main campsite where they live for most of the year. But they still go for four months every year in September to another campsite away where they live in tents. They're still nomads. Eventually, they're getting so rich that they will build houses in this uh, separate campsite, so they'll have houses in both. And when they move, what do they do with the house? They lock the door. And if they have a lot of stuff in it, they'll leave the parent or the grandparent to look after it. So it doesn't mean just by virtue of, of having a house that in Tibet, now that's different in Shanghai, something different where they're resettling nomads. But in Tibet, having houses is a voluntary thing that they're doing because they think it's an advantage. And what do they do after that? They build an extension on the house just like us and a second extension and then they get beds with foam rubber. Uh, a lot of changes like that to make their life better. Uh, they've also changed from yachts to trucks and tractors. The yacht made nomadic life possible on the plateau because these tents are 200 pounds. And so to move with the tents, you can't do it on a sheep and you can't carry it, so you had to have a yacht. Yacht are impervious to cold. There's no altitude too high for them. So they were the best animal that made movement on the plateau possible. But they're not an easy animal. They don't go like sheep in a line. If they're 10 yak, they go 10 uh, directions. And the nomads following them are running after them all the time. They used to hate to travel with yak because in the early years, you had to go 
or animal or horse, because they're always running after them, and the yak are throwing off their loads, and it takes hours to put the loads back on. They, uh, they have little saddles, uh, I, I don't know if you can see one here, on top of it, and then they tie these bags on, uh, which are woven by the nomads themselves, and, and then they go on trips like this. Uh, in for the winter trip, the men would go for two months, three months in winter, taking their products, wool, uh, butter, whatever they wanted to sell, to farming areas, and they would trade or sell to the farmers and get the products that they want. So that was the traditional economy for the excess that they had. Then st it started pretty early in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, that they started using trucks. And I can't go into the whole story, but the first truck failed, and the guy went bankrupt of trying to move animals because his truck broke and he couldn't get the animals to sell at the right time. Uh, here's a bunch of wool they're selling. And I thought that the nomads will never be able to do that. These people were really, it's a, it's a remote area. They had never seen a European. They'd ha they had never seen a potato. And Tibetans eat potatoes. Uh, and the idea, I thought they, uh, they could never do it. And the first truck was just ruined. But I was wrong. And I was wrong about the farmers, too. Tibetans are not idiots, and they're not sitting back passively waiting uh, for somebody to take care of them. They're actively doing stuff, and they have mastered trucks. Uh, a lot of them now have these tractor trailers. So now when they move their camp in September, uh, for, for four months, nobody uses jocks anymore. They use little tractor trailers or a truck to move the tent and everything that, that they want. Life is changing. It's a substitution. It's putting something more effective uh, they're less effective. We used to have horse and buggies in the United States. Nobody would say we lost our culture in America because we stopped using horse and buggies. Even in the crazy world of 24-hour TV, nobody would probably say that. Uh, but uh, the, the, the Tibetans don't feel that way either. They've also gone from horses to motorcycles. These people didn't have a bicycle uh, until um, about 1990, but uh, when they got the first truck and and the bicycles. In 2005, we went there, 40% had motorcycles. In 2000, nobody had one. I couldn't dream that they would have a motorcycle. By 2005, they not only had them, but they knew how to fix them and take care of them. And that changed their life. You know, this is, these two guys, we drive down a big valley in our Toyota Land Cruiser, uh, which is popular in Tibet. And these two families are on either side of this big valley on a hill. And so the, they both saw me, they're old friends and uh, they wanted to come and visit with me that year. And so he had his son go get his horse. What does that mean? You can't keep your horse near your house or tent because there's no food to eat. They have to go out and graze all day. So they put the animals up in the mountains, the horses. So when you want your horse, you don't just say, bring me the horse. You gotta send your kid or you go up in the mountains and look for them. And hopefully it's in the same valley where you left it. <laughs> but if not, you have to go find it. Uh, we would often see a strange nomad coming through this area in the middle of the summer, and invariably when we ask him, what are you doing here? You know, where are you going? I'm looking for my horse. Uh, uh, so uh, he didn't get it there till the next day. He got to my place at about noon the next day. This guy's in the other valley. He had a motorcycle, he hopped on. He got his wife, his sister, his, his kids. They came within an hour and a half of our arrival, spent the afternoon, and they were going home that night. It's revolutionized their life. When I first went, there were people from one side of this one nomad group uh, to the other side who had never seen the people in the other side, the women and kids. They saw the men at meetings and that, uh, or on trading, but they had never seen them because it was so hard to travel and so long. But that's all, all changed now. Then solar, like, solar electricity came. When I first went, they were lighting it. The more wealthy people were using candles. candles. The poorer people had oil with a wick but not much of a light. Uh, uh, then they got small solar generators, medium-sized solar generators, big solar generators. Uh, and with the motorcycles then in 2009, when we came there, all of a sudden people had cell phones, unbelievable. Uh, they wanted our phone numbers, they wanted my phone number. Uh, and they wanted uh, my students uh, who went to school at Case Western, uh, who were coming with me to help me, uh, their phone numbers. And they were trying hard to learn how to use them. This one is one of the more modern people. He was teaching this guy you know, how you use a cell phone, it's not so obvious. Uh, so uh, there have been tremendous changes like that. Now on mountains in the TAR, in nomad country, you don't just see prayer flags, but you see solar electric to run the cell towers. Uh, they will have soon uh, internet in the, town, uh, in, in the township centers uh, where the schools are. So this is just things that have changed, but now look at before and after. I have a number of these, but I'll just show you two. This is one of the early houses. It's pretty grim. 
Uh, and I would not have wanted to live in it. I, th I think it was dusty and dirty. It was pretty terrible, despite the wind. But I'm only staying there for a short time in winter. I'm not staying there for eight months. So they were a little bit more liberal about what they would uh, put up with. 1987. This is a nomad's house in 2005. Uh, it's not the same house, but it's the same village. Uh, and uh, here you can see, similar to what the village had, but not as elaborate, they had painted, painted cabinets and nice tables and uh, you see boom boxes here, solar light, a solar run light. There is an alarm clock here. Women work hard there, and they, and they have to get up early to milk the animals early. It, it's a tremendous change in the quality of life. After that, when I went back to 2009, she had built the house bigger even. Uh, there are only three people in her family, but still, it's just what we do. They want to make it better and bigger, because what are you going to spend your money on? They're not investing in the stock market yet. So <laughs> they invested in themselves, having a better life. Uh, when they get permanent electricity in a few years, the government will spend a tremendous amount of money and put it in there, I'm sure. Then they'll all have TV sets and they can spend more money on that. Uh, this is the cheese I said. After you take the buttermilk and you boil it again, this cheese comes out. It's a tart cheese, not bad. Uh, and they eat some of it fresh and then they dry the rest. They're, they're putting it out on uh, plastic and bags that they get when they buy stuff and they dry it and it dries perfectly. Well, this is what people looked like in 1987 in, in the nomad area. Not too tidy. Uh, I actually wrote in a book I wrote on nomads uh, uh, called Nomads of Western Tibet uh, that I was embarrassed to have these photographs in there, to be honest. And I said that at that high altitude and that cold climate, you couldn't keep clean. Uh, I couldn't keep clean. That was probably because they didn't wash enough is what it turned out to be. Uh, but 2005, this is the same girl in the same place, doing the same work. Tremendous changes that are going on. This is not the government. The party secretary is not there yelling at them, clean, clean, wash your hands. <laughs> Somehow, I don't know how they did it. They did it because now they have motorcycles, I think, and trucks. People come from outside, much more traders. They see how other people live, and they've learned that way, and they have begun to spend a lot more time washing their clothes. But notice they changed their hairdo. She no longer wears this. This is all braided, about 100 braids. Uh, and they've stopped, and now they usually comb their hair uh, uh, this way. At a wedding, they'll dress it like this. But they change that. They change their facial makeup. They change a lot of stuff. But nobody's making them do that, just as we change all the time. Uh, uh, we have different fads in music. Hip-hop, rock and roll was once thought to ruin American culture. Uh, it hasn't, and many things like that. So they change, and when I ask them, why did you change your facial makeup? They used to wear black makeup on, on your face. And then I, don't, I took out that slide uh, for time, then they changed to put white on your face. And they said, we just don't do that anymore. Put the black on, which sounds just like my kid's answer. Anytime I would ask him when he was in high school, why are you doing that? Why don't you do this? We don't do that anymore. So uh, they have the same attitude. But they don't think it's losing their culture. They think their culture is fine. They're still nomads. They call themselves drogba. And if they have a motorcycle and not a horse, they think that's fine. The horse, they still keep their horses for ceremonies, but now they have an easier, better way to live. So what accounts for all of this in nomad country? One of it is going for income, migrant labor. They don't do that at all, because nomads don't like to do manual labor. Uh, second is they have more animals. They just increased the number of animals since 86 when I first went there. But that didn't happen. There are limits on the number of animals. There's a stocking limit to preserve the grasslands. So there's only a minuscule increase in per capita uh, number of animals. So what did they do for that? Large increases in the price of nomad product. The nomads, although they haven't gone anywhere, their products are now part of the national economy and the international economy for Kashmir. Uh, that uh, the skins that they have and the animals, Chinese want more meat, are now very valuable. And you can see these are astonishing increases. And then you look at barley here and you can see why the nomads with the same amount of animals are generating enough income to uh, have these products. But they know that that's a difficult thing to do. So their aim is not to go out to work as migrant laborers, but to cut out the middlemen who come and buy their goods at a low price. And who is doing that? Chinese? No, not at all. Tibetans from Sichuan are coming out, and they're buying stuff at a low price and selling it in the cities in Lhasa and, and that. So they're trying to start co-ops to market their product, but that's not so easy to do. That's pretty hard to do. Uh, so in conclusion then, 
There's been rapid change and adaptation, increasing integration into the market economy throughout rural Tibet. Now, it'll be less in the most remote farming villages and more in the ones near a city, but it's a process that started and is not going to change. It's not going to change so long as the Chinese keep throwing in money. Tibet has nothing. They have minerals, but there's no industry. All this money is not coming from the Tibetan uh, uh, basic producing wealth and spending it. It's coming from the government spending it for political reasons. So if that keeps up, then they'll keep being jobs, and it's like the bubble economy uh, here. And so long as the bubble's there, everybody has a lot of jobs, and they can take loans and pay them back. But that's changing all over, uh, this uh, integration in market economy going for income rather than just subsistence farming. There's been market improvement in material life, the quality of life, the food they eat, the health care they have. Although I, you know, it's easy to say the positive, but 35% of the nomads' households are poor and something like 25% of these farming households are poor also. So it's not that they've eliminated poverty any more than we have. It's a real problem. What do you do with poor people? And they don't have any answer there either, except give them welfare, which is what basically happens. But the welfare is at a low level, and so there are big problems even in terms of this economics going on there. Third, rural Tibetans are not marginalized and passive. They're not sitting there watching the Chinese take everything and them s simply be saying, woe is us. That's what people say here, but that's not what they're doing. As you see, they're planning and plotting and doing stuff and thinking, trying to get their kids in school. In one village, they take the excess daughters who don't marry because of polyandry, and they specifically try to get them the best education so they can go into a city and get some jobs and then help the old parents uh, when they have fights with their daughter-in-law. I'm not kidding. Uh, 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 so there are a lot of thinking about the changes and understanding them. The phones and cell phones have been really important. There was one family in the village whose sons were very nasty to her, probably because she was nasty to them or the wife. Uh, uh, she didn't say that, but that's usually the case. So nasty that uh, she would sneak out and use a cell phone to call her son, who was a, an official in Lhasa, and then the son would call and intervene. So it's even given elderly some, uh, some agency in getting other kids in the family to know what's going on or, or right away. People are smart and they're using stuff as best they can. Now, they can't get contracts for skyscrapers or big buildings in Lhasa, but they're doing stuff and moving up the ladder. And finally, they see their life as being improved by the new consumer goods and technology, not that their culture is being destroyed. I spent a lot of time asking this. And if they're not in a political a situation where they're trying to tell a tourist something bad about the Chinese for a political effect, if they're just living in their, uh, in their village, uh, they really don't see that at all. They have no uh, idea that anything is being lost. Their life is just improving. So the culture is still intact in rural Tibet in the Tibet Autonomous Region, and pride and identity is deep and strong, really strong. Uh, they're not embarrassed about their, their culture. They're angry at the Chinese for looking down on their culture. So anyway, let's get to the final uh, comments is that, so the Chinese internal strategy is to win over the Tibetans. Uh, are they succeeding in this? Uh, well, here's a shot of one of the young men. His name is Norbu. He's the barefoot doctor in 1987, 88, and that's what he and his, his brother looked like. They were still wearing braids and bangs and that in the traditional way. And this is Norbu in, in, uh, in 2005. Uh, and this is, uh, he uh, looks like he could be in Vogue magazine uh, in some <laughs> chic ad for Nomad Chic. Uh, uh, he's, he's still the barefoot doctor. But uh, the picture on his motorcycle windshield is of the 10th Panchen Lama. There's a big controversy a few years ago when the 10th Panchen Lama died in 1989, and the Dalai Lama picked an 11th Panchen Lama, and the Chinese said he's not, and they put him in detention, and they picked their own Panchen Lama. So there are two Panchen Lamas, but the one that is public is the, is the Chinese Panchen Lama. He won't do that. Now, these are people who are not political at all. They're not f fans of Dalai Lama, uh, of Dharamsala, or anything like that. They're not even up to that level of being aware of what's going on outside, uh, other than that the Americans, they think, are helping them. But he wouldn't put the Chinese Panchen Lama on there, so as a sign of protest, the protest of the week, he put the 10th Panchen Lama. That's what they do, because that the Chinese can't say anything about, but any Chinese or Tibetan official, communist official, will know that it's a protest. So even in remote areas like that, and even when their life materially has improved, there are a lot of grievances, a lot of anger and resentment 
Advant Tibetans. I could spend another lecture talking about that, but there's some residual anger over how they were treated during a cultural a revolution, tearing down their monasteries. And then after 1959, there was a lot of struggle sessions, very nasty stuff that went on in Tibet, in the Tibet Autonomous Region. There are too many restrictions on monasteries and religion, uh, monastic religion, uh, too many limits. Many Tibetans, even these villagers, uh, will say, how can the Han Chinese tell us how many monks they have in a monastery? The country says that there's a religious freedom. So there's a lot of feeling of anger that they're just not treating them fairly in a country, so they're not gonna be loyal to the government. That they're not gonna say, we're happy to be citizens of China when the Chinese government is not treating them fairly the way they think they ought to be. Uh, there's also too many Chinese in cities and towns. They're not in the rural areas, but they're in the towns and the cities, and they control most of the businesses and industry. Uh, and too little power to Tibetans. Often the Tibetan in charge of an office uh, has the title of president of the university, but the real person is the party secretary who you never see. They never show it to, to the foreigner, uh, but he's the one who really has the power. So everybody knows that. Uh, too much Han chauvinism. The kind of Han in the hardline Han, the ones who are in power, and they're in power because there's a hardline strategy now to uh, show Tibetans that China is, uh, is, that Tibet's a part of China and we can do what we want, basically, in, in short, and too little respect for Tibetan language, culture, and uh, religion, and people resent being treated that way, just as uh, minorities in our country resented being treated and looked down on, and still do in many cases, because there's still a lot of uh, racial discrimination in the United States. Uh, and the government campaign to demean the Dalai Lama uh, to try to convince people that he's a demon and a terrible person is insulting to them, just as it would be to Catholics if we started, if President Obama started along a campaign to insult the Pope. Uh, 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 now, the same Catholics who don't listen to the Pope and are using breath control would be infuriated uh, if uh, our government insulted the Pope. So many. Tibetans would not listen to what the Dalai Lama says if he specifically said, do this. If it was against their interest, they probably wouldn't uh, uh, because they're realistic the same way many Catholics are here. But to have leaders do that is an insult, and it's meant as an insult, and they take it as that. So, and critically, uh, unlike other minorities, these people have the Dalai Lama outside, which always makes them think that, hmm, maybe it's still better to wait for the Dalai Lama to get them more of what they want than what the Chinese are willing to give us. So what's happening now, I think, is that uh, the Chinese government is just starting now to go beyond making them a better uh, quality of life in terms of material wealth and social services, but to start to address some of these grievances. Just two days ago, the new party secretary announced a new program to begin to give old monks in monasteries pensions, to give salaries to monks, uh, to give monks health care. They weren't able to have that. The government put no money into the monasteries at all. The monks had to generate their own income to uh, uh, run a monastery of, of even 500, uh, let alone 10,000 the way they used to have. That is, I think, it may not win over the uh, angry monks immediately, but it's a gesture, a symbol, that those people who think cracking down on Tibetans and treating them badly and insulting them is not the way to go, and they're gonna try to see if they can do a little bit better and maybe gradually loosen up some of these uh, grievances and, and insults. So I'd like to end with this slide uh, because number one, I'm in there. Uh, but <laughs> this was uh, after work, we were living here uh, in the local clinic. And so after work, I go out for a walk. Uh, and uh, these women were coming back from fixing an irrigation canal. And this kind of symbolizes the atmosphere in the villages. So these women uh, are, are kidding around with the anthropologists. They're uh, uh, making fun of the anthropologist by, by telling me, why don't I marry this girl? You, you know, I can marry her and take her back to, to America. And we're joking like that, you know, to kind of banter. And, but this is what it is. They're all enjoying themselves, having fun, and this symbolizes that they're not sitting there in a corner afraid of the local party secretary. They're not. Uh, in these villages all over Tibet where, where I am and where there's no political protest, the government has a very loose hand on them. Now, if they did something, it would change overnight. But it, they are not doing anything, and so they're leading their lives, and it's not bad. Uh, Tibet is much better than we thought, thank God, uh, and their culture is intact, and hopefully, if either the Chinese internal strategy gradually becomes more so that Tibetans can feel like a semi-valued minority in China, 
uh, or it leads to some agreement with the outside, which is unlikely, then Tibetan culture will not have been lost. Uh, uh, and that then future generations will be proud Tibetan speaking their language by and large and uh, living pretty good lives, more modern than they had when they started after the Cultural Revolution. Thanks. <laughs> We will, now be take, we will now be taking questions. As usual, preference goes to students and faculty members. Hi. Um, how has some of these new economic and lifestyle changes impacted the Tibetan tradition of sending sons to serve in monasteries? Well, yeah, I, I couldn't get into the monasteries, but uh, the monasteries, when they reopened them in 1981-82, they had limits on the numbers of monks. So the, mon so the monastery, Drebung outside Lhasa, that had 10,000 monks, they had 300, then 500. So there's strict limits, there's strict control over the monasteries, particularly the monasteries that have been dissidents, like the monasteries around Lhasa and some of these ones in, in Sichuan. So that's a grievance also. Uh, you, you know, they say, we want to make our sons monks, and uh, particularly before going for income started. At that time, if you have four sons, often they didn't want to marry four sons to one wife. It's not easy to have three brothers marry a wife, but it's harder to have four. And so if one of the brothers didn't get along too well, they would often make him a monk. So by not having that access, they uh, lost one option. The same with making girls nuns. So uh, they did not like that, and they don't like that. Uh, they do have monks, and they, they can have monks come in their house. They can go to monasteries. They have more money, so they spend more money on a religion now than they ever did. Uh, many of these local people are building new monasteries. If in Lhasa they want to build one, they won't let them. But in areas where they're not being hostile, they can build new monasteries and new nunneries, and the government lets them. But there's tight control over everything. So they resent that. You know. As the Christians do, who don't want to join the government Protestant church or the government uh, Catholic church, and they have underground churches. It's, it's, it's a similar thing. The Chinese are bad to all groups who pose a threat to them, whether they're, whether they're Christian or Falun Gong or Tibetan monks. Hi. Uh, you've talked about the benefits of um, migrant la labor for uh, the Tibetan people, but how does an underrepresented minority such as Tibetans protect themselves from the notorious abuses of migrant uh, migrant laborers, such as, you know, being forced to work extra long days or uh, having their employers withhold their pay? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this is, uh, number one, I, I, I should have probably mentioned this, but uh, these people work in Tibet. These villages don't know Chinese, so they can't work in any Chinese area. They're working in Tibet. Uh, now, they're often working for Chinese or Tibetan contractors, and so there is some of that, and there was a lot of trouble with people working all summer and they're not getting paid. Since then, over the past, 10 years, the government has put in a certain kind of legal system, a easy legal system for these kind of salary disputes. And they say that they can go to these uh, uh, almost arbitrators and uh, get action. And so the amount of abuse of not being paid has dropped down a lot. When I first went and it first started, there'd be a lot of people who say, my son went for six months and he didn't get paid, or we only got a small amount. You almost never hear that in, anymore. So they've taken some steps. The Chinese government, for things like insurance and that, have taken steps to try to meet needs within the limits of their system. Uh, and so that is always a problem. But uh, Tibetans now, there's a shortage of labor, and so they can just leave and go somewhere else now. But people now use cell phones, and Chinese contractors call them up, and they call the one or two people who speak Chinese in, in the village and say, we need 20 workers, and somebody will round up 20 workers. There were some people in the village who work as, as collectors. Uh, the Chinese guy calls them and says, send me people. He'll go find them and bring them. Then he'll explain the job in Tibetan, because he speaks Chinese, to, to the workers, and then he'll leave, and he gets a cut of their salary. Lots of things are, are going on. But it's all part of a thing of, trying to improve themselves. But there are always abuses, and uh, it's improved, though, from the early days. Um, why doesn't the government ban uh, the polyandry? I thought that the Chinese government explicitly outlaws that. Yes, they certainly do outlaw it, but Tibet's a minority area, and so they haven't made it legal. But they don't stop it, and they don't stop it because this is what we would think of uh, humoring the minority culture. 
They're supposed to have the right in Tibet to have their own culture, and so they can't go so far as to say it's legal, but they won't go so far as to try and stop it. And that's the reason why. So that's a case where the Chinese in some areas can make concessions like that against their constitution, uh, and it's a question if in more dangerous ones, uh, the one wife and four brothers are not threatening them, but the monks in a monastery, if there were 5,000, might. Uh, so they're gonna go much slower in that kind of area. Hi, yeah, thank you for speaking us to, uh, to us tonight. Um, uh, yeah, do many students go on to colleges or universities? And if they do, uh, do they come back to the villages to help out their families and communities, or do they stay in more yeah, urban that's areas? A, that's an excellent question. That's changed completely. The attitude toward religion has changed completely. What the Chinese government has done, I don't remember when it, it, exactly. I haven't looked at those for a long time. They started setting up schools in internal China. Uh, 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 high schools, and so junior high schools and high schools, I think, maybe even some primary schools. So Tibetans would go from central Tibet uh, to these schools and spend four, five, six years there. The idea being that they could learn Chinese better and then have a chance of going to senior high school and college or to vocational schools, and lots of students have gone thousands and thousands. So uh, at first it was only the students in Lhasa where they know more Chinese to start with. In fact, many of the parents of Tibetans in Lhasa send their kids to Chinese medium school. There are two kinds of schools in Tibet. Uh, the Tibetan school teaches Tibetan as the medium of instruction, and then there are Chinese schools, because there's so many Chinese, where Chinese is the medium of instruction from the first grade on. Many Tibetans, even the most rabid nationalist ones, when it comes to their kids' future, they send their kids to, to the Chinese one, because they'll get into a school in internal China and get into college and have a much a better life. So a lot of kids have gone to China. More and more of them have gone to colleges now. Uh, in the villages we're in, the nomads have no chance because their Chinese is never any good. It may get better in the future when they get the internet and they can have better programs in Chinese and see movies and, and that, it will, but right now they don't have that. In the villages, some of the better students in there have been taken to high school and then sent to inner China and a number of them have gotten jobs when they came back, not in the village, there's nothing for them to do in the village, but they get jobs as teachers. So the teachers I showed you are all people like that who either went to the teacher's college in Lhasa or they went to internal China and, and study. What's happened in the villages is that these people are terrific. They have like a segmented family now. So the main families in the village with these polyandrous families, and then if you have one kid or one daughter working out there, they, are a, they play a real close role uh, uh, in the family uh, in, in the sense that when there are fights, like I mentioned, uh, the kids from outside will come in and intervene and, in fact, tell people to change their behavior. Why? Because if they want to buy that 250,000 uh, renminbi truck, then they may ask for 100,000 from the son who's working for the government or the daughter. So they have a lot of power because of their economic clout, their contact in the upper kinds of government there. And so it's changed the thing that families want some of their kids to try to get that education. When I first went, nobody would do anything about kids, uh, about education, as I said. In 2007 or eight, uh, seven or nine, I was walking one night, again, walking out for my evening walk, and I came across an old lady, a grandma, uh, because I'm a grandpa, so I, I mean, I shouldn't talk, but she looked older than me. And she was by this big tree where the local uh, mountain god lives. Not a mountain god, but the local god lives. And so she was tying something on it, so I went over and asked her, what are you doing? They have an exam when uh, the next day, all over China, they take an exam from junior high school to get into high school, high school into college. Her grandson was taking the exam and she was tying a prayer so that the gods will help her son to pass. And that would have been impossible to dream of in 1997 when I first started working in these areas. So the families have changed, there were a lot of changes like that. It's not as much because their Chinese is really poor, but I think it'll improve over time. Now, they could have a Chinese teacher in that mountain a village, but they don't because it's a Tibetan area and it would be difficult uh, to do. People would not like it. But in the ones who go to the town schools and the county schools, they have Chinese teachers for Chinese and for other subjects. So those kids have a chance at scoring on the exams and going. One, one woman who was the, the communist uh, female official in charge of the females, uh, their, their family planning and these kind of things, her daughter failed the high school test. So I asked her, where is her daughter? And uh, you know, I, I came back and said, how did your daughter do? She said, she didn't pass. I said, oh, what are you doing? She put her in a private school in that nearest town, Shigase, 
for 5,000 RMB, which is a lot of money there, uh, so she could get private tutoring to take the test next year. So people understand that are interested. It's a big change. It's a good change. Hi. Um, could you uh, briefly comment on dominant gender roles uh, in Tibetan society and whether or not those expectations have changed with modernization? Well, it's a little bit different in farmers and nomads. Uh, in nomad society, men and role have men and women have distinctive roles. The men do nothing in summer, which is most of the year, uh, and in winter they go out on these trading trips. But so for all summer, the men just sit around. Uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, and the women do all the work. What do they need an alarm clock for in nomad country in the middle of nowhere? Because in order to milk the sheep and the goats and the ox and the sheep and goats twice a day, they need to start early, like five o'clock in in the morning. Uh, and it's 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 pitch black because they're using Beijing time. Uh, so it's probably two o'clock in the morning. So they need an alarm clock, and they get up and they're milking them in the dark. You know, uh, uh, so uh, women have a much harder role, and they say it. And many of them complain to me that our husbands used to be completely useless and didn't do anything. Now that they have motorcycles and trucks, they spend all of their time that they're either not, not uh, sitting around fixing the cars and talking about them and playing with them like uh, some men do here. So uh, there's a lot of criticism. But women can criticize their men there, and Tibetan villagers also do. So the women in villages do the inside work in the house, and they do the field work, not the plowing, but they do all the uh, 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 Weeding and that kind of stuff, really hard work. Uh, they do a lot of work. So there is that, and it's not changing much. In the urban areas it is, but in the rural areas, women have a much, much harder time. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have this evening. Please join me in thanking Professor Goldstein for his talk tonight.